Hi friends, welcome to the New York State Museum and thanks for joining us for another one of our virtual field trips. My name is Kat Morehouse and I am a museum instructor here and today we're going to be talking about Ellis Island and the immigration experience from about 1870 to 1920. That's the height of the immigration and voluntary migration of people from Europe to the United States so that's the time period we're going to be focusing on. If you have any questions or just want to let us know that you're here use the comment box below and we'll be able to answer any of those questions. So we're going to get started with this image here. What we see here is a contemporary image. It's not from that long ago. We have the island of Manhattan in the back with all of those skyscrapers. And in front we have Liberty Island with the iconic Statue of Liberty. And to the left we see, you guessed it, Ellis Island. Now on Ellis Island, there's a whole bunch of buildings. There's dormitories, there's a hospital, the registration room, and an area for ferries to park. But what is Ellis Island? Ellis Island is an immigration processing station. It was opened in 1892 and stayed operational through 1954. And if you notice the shape of Ellis Island, it's a perfect rectangle. Now, do you guys think islands are formed in perfect shapes? No. This is a man-made island that was built on top of an existing smaller island. Now, the reason that they decided to build on top of Ellis Island to create this immigration processing station was to replace an existing state-run facility called Castle Garden that was on the island of Manhattan. The reason that they wanted to create a new facility was because the U.S. saw an increase in immigration in the 1800s. So why was there an increase in immigration in the 1800s? Well, there's many factors that come into play when somebody decides to move from one country to another. Some reasons are factors that push people out of their home country, things like poverty, uh, scarcity of food or resources, uh, violent conflicts. So in the 1800s we see things like the revolutions happening in Germany and the Irish potato famine. There are other factors that pull people in to a new country and those are things like access to education, economic advancement, opportunities for more uh, work experiences in the growing industries and in the factories that are popping up or to rejoin family members. So there are a, a vast array of reasons why somebody would leave their home country and go to a new country and they all mostly stem around the idea of a better opportunity uh, or the opportunity to have a better life in a new area. But it's not an easy decision for anyone to make. So how are people traveling to the United States from these European ports? Well, if we're looking at the 1700s and early 1800s, they're coming by sailboats. Now, sailboats are powered by what? Wind, yep. So this trip could take anywhere from one to two months. Now that's one to two months without regular access to bathing, that's one to two months eating hardtack, that's one to two months dealing with seasickness. So this was not an easy trip. But in the 1800s, we start seeing the use of steamships. And steamships were able to cut the time down for traveling from up to two months to about one to two weeks. Now, it also made the tickets more affordable and accessible for people of lower economic means, lower income. Not all tickets aboard a steamship would be the same price. You could buy a first class ticket, which cost about $90, which in today's currency is well over $2,000, and that would give you access to a private luxury estate room, all the amenities aboard the ship, and if you wanted to spend a little bit less money, you could buy a second class ticket. A second class ticket, you'd still have private rooms and you'd still have access to amenities aboard the ship. And the big benefit to having a first or second class ticket was you were able to get inspected aboard the ship. 
Now, the lowest cost ticket was a third class ticket or a ticket in steerage. This cost about $30, which in today's currency is still pretty expensive, over $900. Um, but all third class passengers were inspected on Ellis Island. So they were not able to disembark the boat and go right into the United States. They had to go through the immigration processing station. Now, one thing that would happen is these steamship companies would try and make as much money off of steerage as possible. So steerage was underneath the ship, no access to ventilation, their bunks were one on top of the other, and we can see here some images of just how many people they would put onto these ships. Now, when you did get to Ellis Island, you would have to get inspected. So you, there was a medical inspection and there was a, a legal inspection. And the steamship companies would send out information like this, the instruction to prepaid passengers. And on here, they would warn the passengers of how to behave on the ship and what kind of questions to expect. So one of the suggestions that the White Star Line gave is to stay above deck as often as possible so that you can get fresh air and to try and help fight disease spreading. So we can see here images of third class passengers st staying above deck and trying to get as much air as they could. Now the reason the White Star Line, which you guys might have heard of, they're also the same company that had the Titanic, pretty famous boat. Um, one of the reasons that they would send these out to their prepaid customers, to their prepaid passengers, was because if an immigrant was not allowed into the United States, if they were sent back to their home country, the steamship companies would be the ones that would have to pay for it. So they wanted to make sure that they weren't losing money on people having to return back to their country of origin. Now these tickets were oftentimes bought by family members that were already living in the United States. They would send back for additional family members and the tickets could, would be good for one year and would include not only your trip on the, on the boat, all the food on the ship, but it would also include any railroad fare getting you to your final destination. Now as we come over here, we can see one of the iconic symbols that immigrants would see as they enter in to the New York City Harbor, the Statue of Liberty. And above me, we have images of some of the 12 million immigrants that passed through Ellis Island. Now, if you were leaving your home country to start a new life somewhere else, what might you bring with you? Now remember, these people are not able to bring everything with them. They have to leave not only their belongings behind, but oftentimes their family members behind. So we see here a lot of images of family members. Now remember, between 1870 and 1920, you can't text, you can't call, there's no email, FaceTime, video conferencing. So if you left your hometown, you might never see some of those loved ones again. So you'd want to make sure that you had something to remember them by. If you are leaving your home country uh, because of religious persecution, it would be important for you to bring those religious objects with you. If you're leaving your home country to find a better uh, economic opportunity, you would bring things of your trade. So let's say you were a mason, you'd want to make sure you had your masonry tools with you. Anything that would help you get started on your new life in your new country. It would also be really important that you had all of your documents with you. All immigrants that had to pass through Ellis Island, you would want to make sure you had your inspection card, your tickets, uh, your passport, any of that those documents that are going to make sure that it is a seamless transition. Now, let's get talking about the actual process once you entered Ellis Island. So once you got on your ferry and you came to Ellis Island, the first thing you would do is you drop your baggage off in the baggage room. 
and then you'd enter the registration room and you'd go up a large flight of stairs. And this is actually where the medical exam began. There would be doctors lining the top of the stairs and they would watch to see if you had a difficult time climbing the stairs for signs of a physical um, disability or if you were sick and weak. Now the medical exam is known for how quick it was. It was called the six second exam. And what doctors are looking for are contagious diseases. So they, what we see here is a doctor looking behind an eye. So he's using a button hook that looks like this. He's pulling the eyelid back and checking behind the eye for signs of inflammation. And that was a sign of trachoma, a very serious and contagious eye disease, which during the time could cause up to 75% of the people who caught it to go blind. So they're checking for different diseases that spread quickly. If you did have anything that they wanted further inspection on, they would mark your back with chalk. So if you had trachoma, they would put a C and a T on your back, and that would be a sign that you would get pulled for further medical exams. If you did pass through the medical examination, you went to the legal examination. The legal examination had 29 different questions. And those questions were checking to see if your name matched the manifest from the ship, what your job was, your occupation, where you were coming from. They wanted to make sure that you were who you said you were and that you had enough money and uh, knowledge to get started right when you left the island. So once you were able to get off the island, you could start your new life in your new country. But unfortunately, some people had to be detained. Now, if you were detained on Ellis Island, it might be for a couple of days, it might be for a couple of weeks, it could even be for a couple of months. Now, there's a story of a little boy named Seymour. He was only eight years old when he immigrated from Poland to the United States. And when he was aboard the ship, he caught a cold and he was detained for a couple of days completely by himself. His father was able to leave the island and he had to stay behind alone as an eight-year-old until he got better. Now, most people that were detained were able to fight their case if it was from a legal inspection or to get better in the hospitals and move on to their lives. Only about 2% of immigrants that were coming through Ellis Island were actually sent back. So it was a very small percentage of people that were sent back. Once you made it off the island, you were on to your new life. So people took railroads and they went west, they went south, they went upstate. Uh, but about one third did stay in New York State and a lot of them stayed right in New York City. Remember New York City, there were growing industries, there were factories, and one of the main things was access to education. So here we have a classroom, PS52, from the Bushwick neighborhood of Brooklyn. And as you can see, there's sliding glass doors. This allowed a teacher to teach as many as a couple hundred students or as few as 30. With these waves of immigration, they saw students coming from Italy, from Russia, from Germany, um, coming into these schools for access to education that they might have not had in their home countries. So here we see the teacher teaching some US history, teaching about voting, teaching about what it means to be a US citizen. We also have schools that taught different trades, taught different skills that these young children could use in their new lives. Another benefit of these schools was that they had morning sessions and afternoon sessions. This allowed children to not only become educated, but to continue working and providing support for their family. A lot of immigrant children had to work to support their household, to financially uh, support their families. And one of the ways in which they did that was by working in sweatshops. So we're gonna go over and check out one of the sweatshops. 
And we have different work that can be done, uh, but one major industry that immigrants took part in was the garment industry. And over here, we see a tenement sweatshop do, with a family doing piecework. So they were subcontracted out and are able to and are paid for each item of clothing that they create. Uh, and we have over here images of different types of piecework that are done. So we have a family making garters, a family working on lace. And you can see just how young some of these children are that are vital for these families to be working. We have a question. Yeah. Why were they called sweatshops? That is a great question. So sweatshops uh, is a term that's used because of the poor working conditions. So they had long hours, low wages. Oftentimes, they, they were not properly ventilated. The safety precautions were really abysmal, uh, which then comes into play when we're looking at the images that we see here and a lot of images that we associate with life in the tenements come from photojournalists like Jacob Reese, who saw How the Other Half Lives, which we have his book here. So not only did photojournalists bring these conditions, these sweatshop conditions to light, we also have the conditions in factories where immigrants worked coming into the light when disaster happens. And this is from the Triangle Factory, Shirtwaist Factory fire in 1911, which the conditions ca caused the fire to be much more damaging. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of people lost their lives. And they were mostly young Jewish and Italian women, young immigrants that were working that lost their lives in accidents like this. But with these things brought to light, we see an increase of labor unions, the labor movement really taking off, and people demanding better protections for the workers, and people demanding better protections for people living in tenements. And one thing I can show you is the, a map uh, created by the Tenement Housing Committee. So some resources that you guys can check out at home, besides Jacob Reese's book, we have the Tenement Housing Committee map where you can see the density of population and the eth ethnicity breakdown of these neighborhoods. So in New York City, we see people moving into areas where they already are familiar with the culture. So if you're a German immigrant, you might move to a German neighborhood. Uh, it's how we end up with our city of neighborhoods having Chinatown and Little Italy and some other resources that you can check out. Seymour's story, the young boy that was uh, forced to stay on Ellis Island by himself as an eight-year-old, is on the Scholastic website. You can actually hear his story in his own voice. And we have reports like the Tenement House Committee report of 1894, and it has details about what the conditions were like in these tenement areas, in these low-income immigrant areas, and what these people were doing to support themselves, how many of them were going to school, how many of them were working, the different ages. So it's a really interesting document that you can check out. Any other questions? We do have a question. What percentage of families lived in tenements? Ooh, that is a really good question. I don't know that off the top of my head. I will find out and I will comment back to you. Thank you for that good question. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. And I just want to remind you guys that of the 12 million immigrants that came through Ellis Island, their stories were as varied and as vast as the people themselves. They were extremely diverse and they're really interesting to learn about. And of those 12 million immigrants, they were able to make our country better. And 40% of Americans can actually track an ancestor back to Ellis Island. So it's made a huge impact on not only New York State, but as the, at the country as a whole. So thank you guys so much for visiting. If there's any questions that we didn't get to, I'll be sure to comment later on today.